So in terms of self-control, I want you to notice that we're halfway through the session and the word immunotherapy has only been mentioned twice in passing. So we're now going to dive into what everybody's talking about, which is the immunotherapy of cancer with Dr. Mikhail Pite, who's an associate professor of radiology and systems biology at the Mass General Cancer Center and has been very focused on imaging T cells and imaging the response to immunotherapy in cancer. Mikhail. Thank you for the nice introduction, and it's a great opportunity to be here at this wonderful meeting. So for the past 18 years or so, I have been passionate about understanding cancer immunotherapy. I said the word. Uh, and now is a very exciting time, as we all know, because we are on the cusp of very uh, interesting research. So what I would like to do over the next 10 minutes is to show you exactly where we are at uh, in my lab today. Um, so we are all aware of Jimmy Carter and his um, current remission from metastatic melanoma. So he received different drugs, including an immune checkpoint blocker that will activate T cells to kill cancer. And late last year, he um, announced, quote unquote, that he was cancer free. So this is a great success story for cancer immunotherapy. Unfortunately, many patients do not yet benefit from the same treatments. So with the goal to increase the quality of life of patients, uh, around 18 years ago, I started to um, investigate some critical knowledge gaps on the immune system and cancer, particularly looking at T cells and understanding how they can recognize cancer. And we did all this work mostly in vitro. So when I established my lab around 10 years ago, we, we realized that investigating cells in vitro may not always be ideal because we cannot always recapitulate the complexity of in vivo environments. So we started to develop tools, including uh, high resolution imaging, to actually visualize uh, immune cell activity, understand how immune cells interact with cancer cells and how immune cells respond to drugs. Um, another thing that we were very interested in was understanding the origins of immune cells that eventually home to the tumor stroma because we realized that very little is known uh, about this particular fact. And in doing so, we also started to uncover some previously unknown mechanisms that tumors use to co-opt uh, to co-opt immune cells in the, in, the, in the entire body. So, you know, going beyond these uh, you know, fundamental studies, um, what I would like to do today is tell you about uh, some translational developments gained from my, my, my previous research and that we are uh, now doing in the lab. And here, I'm particularly interested in finding new ways to make tumors responsive to, um, to immunotherapies. So the way we approached this uh, in the lab was to use a mouse model of lung cancer that is called KP. And it's a very uh, famous model for being resistant to essentially all current cancer treatments, including immune checkpoint blockade therapies like anti-PD-1 or anti-CTLA-4, as you can see here on, on this survival uh, plot. So we challenged ourselves in the lab by asking whether it would actually be possible to make these tumors responsive to immune checkpoint blockade. And we took um, a road that involves different steps that I want to present to you today. So the first thing that we did was to screen drugs for their ability not only to kill cancer cells, but to do so in a way that is immunogenic. So what I mean by this is that we wanted to find drugs that would make tumor cells release so-called immunogenic factors. And the bottom line here is that most, or if not all, of the drugs that are given today to lung cancer patients failed to generate these phenotypes. But in our essay, we found a few drugs, particularly one combination, which was oxaliplatin and cyclophosphamide, so two very old chemotherapeutics, that when combined, were very efficient at triggering these immunogenic phenotypes. So we thought it would be interesting to move this forward and actually analyze whether these types of combinations would actually change 
the microenvironment uh, in these mice. So here I'm showing you two examples. On the left is conventional chemotherapy. Uh, here we used paclitaxel and carboplatin because it's often used in combination given to lung cancer patients. And as you can see here, this combination fails to detectably change the tumor microenvironment. We were specifically looking at T cell infiltration in these tumors, and this did not happen. The new combination that we found through our screen changed the microenvironment and particularly induced potency due to T cell infiltration in these tumors. So we were at an interesting point here because we could start to ask whether having these cells now within the tumor stroma could be sufficient to make this tumor sensitive to immunotherapy because if we come now with immune checkpoint blockers, maybe these T cells can become activated and actually recognize and kill the tumor cells. So that's what we did. And, and the answer is remarkably yes. So on the right here, you can see very durable control of cancer of mice that have been sensitized with these drugs and then given immunotherapy. And in fact, these mice had to be sacrificed on the 234 for ex vivo analysis. But at this time, as you can see here on the right, the tumors continued to be controlled by the drugs. And we also already extended these findings to other cancer types, including fibrosarcoma and uh, colon cancer. And the bottom line here, or the take home message is that if we select drugs for their ability to generate immunogenic phenotypes on tumor cells, on given tumor cells, then these tumor cells can become sensitive to immune checkpoint blockade therapy. And here are two uh, main individuals in my lab who uh, worked uh, on, on this research with me. So we are excited about this because we feel that this may really change or influence um, future therapies for cancer patients. But of course the question is now what is coming next? These are, no, these are mouse studies. So I would like to finish here by giving a few you know, you know, personal thoughts uh, on what we have done and where we want to go. But the first thing is there is so much excitement today on immunotherapy that this has generated a very large number of clinical trials that aim essentially to combine drug A with drug B. And my feeling is that many of these trials uh, are motivated by speed more than by rational. And the more we study this uh, in, 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 in our animal models and in clinical samples that we have, we realize that a rational approach should be really much more effective. The second point also, and you know, linked to the first one actually, is you know, we could also consider doing the type of approach that we are doing, not only to understand you know, what should be done in a given patient when it is, or he or she is diagnosed with the disease, but also as tumors progress, you know, when, when some treatments start to fail and, you know, in, in considering what we can do after you know, resistance uh, emerges. The second point is we have now only tested a limited number of FDA-approved agents. We did this for clinical translatability. But any drug panel that you have could be tested in our system, and it would be very important to really widen the drugs uh, that we test in, in our systems. The third point is, I not, did not have time to show this to you here, but we are now really trying to understand how drugs work in vivo. So we have now new imaging methods, very high resolution imaging methods, that enable us to know where drugs go at the subcellular level, and then what they do to immune cells or to cancer cells. And I really believe that this will completely change the way we understand how drugs fail or how drugs work in the very near future. And, and I think this is a fascinating area that you know, we, we should uh, be looking at. Also, you know, the, the spotlight now is on T cells. This is for a good reason. We know that when we target these cells, we can really impact patients' lives. But we also know that this is much complex than that. So only in our own studies, we know that a subset of myeloid cells is key to treatment. If we get rid of these myeloid cells, our treatment fails. We also know that the microbiome is key. If we treat our mice with antibiotics, our treatment fails. But we don't know why, we don't know how. So there is much more that needs to be done here as well. So at the end, what I really am interested in is establish key partnership and move this to clinical practice 
to really uh, eventually find ways to improve more patients' quality of life. And based on what I showed you on rational design of, of, of drugs, I think this will require you know, precision medicine approaches, and I'm more than happy to discuss more with, with you um, uh, today or, or later. Uh, and these are my, my, this is my contact if you, if you want to reach me. Thank you very much for your attention.